accurate? Mm -hmm. Accurate as far as the description? Uh, reading girls, yes. Yeah. All right, so we're going to go into chapter four in Rad Bio just for a little bit today. I want your brain to decompress some from that exam. It's always fun pulling up the old physics material. All right, so chapter four it is talking about radiation quantities and units. So we're going to get more into depth on what we need to know as far as what's measured and what, why do we take this measurement, what did it initially begin with. So it starts out talking about the discovery of x-ray on page one. You can read it if you want to. If you don't recall, Conrad uh, Rankin was able to produce an x-ray by beginning use with a pear-shaped tube known as a Crookes tube. When he turned off the light and darkened it with the cardboard, he was able to actually produce an x-ray. What's amazing about this discovery is he discovered the 12 properties of x-rays that have never changed. So a pretty, pretty remarkable study um, that he was able to determine that something was going on and describe it in terms of an invention, but never really got credit for it. So he did die a poor man, even though he received a Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize, he never actually trademarked the production of radiation. Um, Thomas Edison shares the discovery of the fluoroscope. Everybody knows that he developed the fluoroscopy unit, right? Live x-ray. Everybody get with that? Yeah. Yeah. Edison. Edison. Thomas Edison. He discovered the fluoroscopy tube. This is on page 59. So he was able to actually figure out how to stream x-ray live, and that is why we are able to do fluoro studies today and use live moving dynamic imaging in OR situations. Um, it does give you one key term here on page 59. It talks about somatic damage. Somatic damage. And this was used to describe the first reports of inner in injuries. So those very, very basic, maybe reddening of the skin or trouble moving the joints or pain at the site. Somatic means body. It's also referred to throughout the book as tissue. So you can kind of associate it that way. So soma, meaning the body, somatic damage, tissue, or the body. So not genetic, not something that's hereditary. It actually had to occur in the body. So directly to you, direct transmission to you, not hereditary, not linked to DNA at all. Then it goes into the inventor of the fluoros fluoroscope, which was Thomas Edison. Um, but his assistant was the first person to die of a radiation-induced cancer on Oct in October of 1904. You definitely want to know that Clarence Daly was the first death of radiation, the first death of actually a radiation-induced cancer. His name is Clarence Daly. So once Clarence Daly died, he was working in the room directly with Thomas Edison, who was kind of the brains behind it. Thomas Edison stopped working on it. He said, I don't want anything to do with x-rays. I don't know what's going on. I know that he died directly from it. I know it, I know it, I know it, I can't prove it. But he stopped his research and didn't go any further. So even though he discovered how to turn the x-ray on and leave it on, you gotta think about it in terms of dose and what was actually being produced. They would put their face on the actual tube to see the moving x-ray. So they were getting so much dose directly to the face, directly to the brain. I mean, these are our pioneers. It's horrible that they died from it, but if they didn't research it and further the evidence of x-rays, we wouldn't be here today. So it saves a lot of people's lives now, but in the beginning, it hurt a lot, a lot of people. So, on the next page, page 60, it gives you a picture of Clarence Madison Daly. He was the first American radiation fatality, and he was Thomas Edison's assistant. So, I for sure want to know that. Um, back in the day, they were kind of confused on how to measure dose. So, they knew that there were actually effects of radiation because they could see um, reddening of the skin, which is radiodermatitis. Want to know that one for sure. That's kind of the first measurement that they used. When the hands started reddening. So radiodermatitis. Radiodermatitis. So when they started noticing this happen, this was happening, these people were already poisoned by radiation. So today we decided, you know, okay, we don't want people to actually show effects on it before we gauge it or before we measurement. So that's why we have all these measurements and units of dosages and limits and occupational doses to protect us. Once you have actual physical damage that you can see on your hands, 
you're going to die from some kind of radiation. We don't know the threshold, we don't know the limit, and it was different for everyone. So this initial dose was called the skin arrhythmia dose. The skin arrhythmia dose. This was developed from, from the 1900s to 1930, and it was the unit used for measuring radiation dose. So the skin arrhythmia dose. So it was the unit used for measuring skin radiation dose? Yes. Yep, skin arrhythmia dose. That's our very first initial dose. So once somebody's hand started reddening, they were like, okay, we need to back you away from radiation because you're actually showing physical signs of it. However, it wasn't accurate because although we know that no amount of radiation is considered safe, there's not a threshold to when you start showing signs. So I can't say if Sienna gets 50 chest x-rays, she's gonna get cancer or Graylin gets 90. It's gonna be different for everybody. So this is why we have to use Alara concepts when we actually x-ray people and when we put them in the CT unit. So it says that it would be comparable to a gray unit today. A gray unit would be a comparison to a skin arrhythmia dose. However, it was extremely inaccurate. So maybe my body is just more resilient and I'm able to get, I don't know, 50 skin arrhythmia dose before I actually show signs versus someone else and someone else and someone else. It does not change the fact that radiation was actually interacting with biological substances and parts in your body and really producing toxicity. So it was a very, very inaccurate dose. All right, so it gives you all of these names here. It kind of talks about the British X-ray and Radium Protection Committee in the paragraph before that. That was the first formal guideline to produce radiation and try to protect us as occupational workers. That was, the that was in 1921, the British X-ray and Radium Protection Committee. So that's our very first committee, our operation to protect occupational workers. British, British X-ray and Radi Radium Protection <laughs> Committee. The British X-ray and Radium Protection Committee. It was in 1921. That's on page 60, right before the skin arrhythmia dose. So the very first units, they tried to hold, it tells you in 1925, the first International College of Radiology was held in London. So a group of radiologists met from all around the world and they were like, what are we gonna do? Well, guess what? They're all radiologists and they all think that they have better ideas than the others because they're all fighting over what's the best route to go. And nothing was ever determined. So they still thought that they could use a Rankin, a Rankin as a measurement. You guys know the difference between traditional versus SI units. So our traditional units are gonna be like RAD, REN, RAD and REN exposure. Those are our more traditional units. RAD and REN are not used on the registry anymore. So if you see anything measured in that as far as dose limits, what you can take, what a baby can take, RAD and REN are not used on the registry. Okay, we use the tradition or the non-traditional, which are the SI or the international units and their standards. So that's why we talk about sievert, gray, coulomb per kilogram. Those are our units that we use today. However, America is always slow to update. So when you get a dosimetry report, it is measured in REM. It's measured in REM. They should be phasing it out. They should be standard to the, the rest of the world internationally but they're not. So think about it in feeders, uh, feeders, feet versus meters. Same kind of concept here. We can actually calculate and translate how many rem equals this many grays or how many sieverts equals this many rads, but we don't have to do that anymore. It's not on the registry. So we're not gonna do actual calculations. So when they couldn't decide on anything in 1925 and in 1928, when they held that International Commission of Radiation Units and Measurements that was formed, they decided, okay, we'll still use the Rankin because he discovered it, so let's just keep his name. It's a standard of unit. Let's stay with the Rankin. After the Rankin was discovered, the Rankin of a unit at least, by the ICRP, which is the International Commission on Radi Radiological Protection, they started noting early tissue reactions early tissue reactions. So there's a little box on the next page, on page 62. It is green, 
It tells you early tissue reactions versus late tissue reactions. And then it has something called stoch stochastic effects. Stochastic and deterministic would be another term for it. We're going to use those in later chapters. But we want to focus today on early tissue reactions and late tissue reactions. On page 62, it's a green box. Looks something like this. What is your book called? Early and late what? Early tissue reactions and late tissue reactions. At the very bottom, it says stochastic. Yeah, that's what the old book says. Okay. What does it say? It's deterministic, dramatic, and... Yes. Oh, no, 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 that's different. Mm -hmm. I think there is one that's different. Okay, so it technically is deterministic, but that's a really in-depth concept. So what I want you to write beside the first one is early. But all you want to know is that it's early, so you can underline it. Okay, you don't have to know that it's deterministic. That doesn't make sense yet because they haven't explained that in the book. <laughs> All right, early versus late, and then you're gonna highlight or underline late. You don't need to know what deterministic or stochastic means yet. We're gonna talk about that in later chapters. It has to do with the amount of radiation you can receive. So early tissue reactions, nausea, fatigue, diffused redness of the skin, radiodermatitis, loss of hair, intestinal disorders, fever, blood disorders, or shedding of the out, outer layer of the skin. These occur in minutes, hours, days, and weeks. So that's how those are measured. Early reactions. Minutes, hours, days, and weeks. Any kind of a late reaction, so late tissue reactions, those are going to be paired with months and years. So months and years. Cataract formation, fibrosis, organ atrophy, loss of parenchymal cells, reduced fertility, sterility. So those are months or years versus the early. Minutes, hours, days, and weeks. We compare these to major radiation accidents like atomic bombs, Chernobyl, things like that. You're not going to see anybody in the United States ever have a reaction from, I don't know, radiation therapy or CT or MRI. I don't know. Right. CT or nuclear medicine, any kind of radiation that we actually give the patient, you're never going to see any early reactions. We don't know about the late reactions. We know that radiation is not considered safe, but we also know that diagnosing the patient and treating them is worth the risk. That's how we determine the diagnostic efficiency, right? So these early reactions, we're never going to see them. It gives you a picture of lesions of the fingers induced by ionizing radiation on page 61. This is gross, but this is actually what happened. So just like the radium girls, day nine from an exposure, not very red. Day 11, getting red. Day 16, they're starting to blister. And day 24, we're having peeling of the outer layer of the skin along with reddening. This person probably has a fever as well. So where does radiation therapy so where does radiation therapy fit into that? Good question. So we have somebody called a dosimetrist, a dosimetrist who determines the amount of radiation that someone can receive for therapy based on hereditary factors and what they've got going on. So for example, if I have breast cancer, my mom had breast cancer, my aunt had breast cancer, I smoke, I drink every day. So those are factors that are increasing my risk. I might be overweight, I might not exercise, I might eat like crap, I might have a vitamin deficiency. So he's gonna allow me to have 50 gray or 50 milligray to my breast cancer, but he sets a limit to determine how much is safe for me to receive. This is why it's really tricky to treat things like pancreatic cancer because it's hidden within your bowel. The pancreas is kind of hidden and tucked away. So radiation therapy skims. So all they do is tangential views. So nothing is direct. So if you're trying to hit a pancreas versus an ascending bowel or a stomach, you've got to skim it without hitting the other organs because they can only receive so much dose and survive. So it is very, very high amounts of radiation, high amount of radiation that's produced with therapy, but it's over a longer amount of time. So they call it like fractionated dose versus protractionated. So where we give somebody an x-ray, that's it, they leave. You guys know probably somebody who's had radiation therapy. They come in either every day or every week. That's fractionating a dose, and it allows the cells to regenerate longer. The more dose given in one sitting, um, risk, and risk and presents a stronger effect of death in the cell. 
Whereas if you stretch it out over time and only get a little bit here and here and here and here, it gives regeneration time to occur. Still can be dangerous. Um, anybody know anybody who's had radiation therapy who's had a burn, like a radiation burn to the skin? It's common. Um, these people will come in, they usually tattoo the area, give them a little tattoo of where they go in and skim every time so they can penetrate the same mass over and over and over again to shrink it essentially. But because radiation is occurring at such a high energy level, it can destroy other cells. So we have to be careful. However, we have to go in through the skin. We don't want to cut someone open and expose them over and over again. So they tattoo that spot and reddening of the skin can occur. But it's, it's all set by dose limits and trying to protect the patients. They would receive the most amount of radiation in any of the modalities. So the highest risk involved there. But if it kills the cancer, the person is able to survive the risk or the benefit outweighs the risk again, right? Lots of people have um, symptoms from radiation and chemo paired with it like finger, um, you can lose the, lose the nerve endings on your fingers, your fingernails might turn blue, some people lose their hair from chemo or radiation, sometimes a combination. So you gotta think whatever we're penetrating that mass or cancerous lesion with, is deadly to it, so it's also deadly to our body. So we have to be careful. Um, so the other day in clinical, we saw like a chemo injection. Uh huh. And it was neon green. Does that have radium in it? Sometimes, sometimes it does. Where was the person wearing gloves who was injecting it? The PA. Yeah. Yeah, they had the two so, sterile gloves. Yeah, like actual uh, lead line gloves. No. No. So it was not radioactive. So if you see somebody holding something that's glowing or some kind of different color, if they're wearing lead line gloves, yes, definitely radioactive. If, it, if they weren't and they were just wearing sterile gloves, they're safe, so they're not gonna receive anything. Even though it's glowing? Yeah, yeah. But there is kind of something in the mix right now where they're trying to create a lead line glass to hold that material. Instead of actually putting it within a lead case, they're trying to develop a glass that's pliable enough. Sorry. Oh, was that mine? Sorry, guys. Here, I'll take it. All right, so after we developed the skin arrhythmia dose, on page 61, they decided, eh, probably not a good idea. Everybody's showing it at different, um, different amounts or different absorbed dosages. So then we come into the tolerance dose. So a tolerance dose that's listed on page 61. A tolerance dose is a radiation dose to which occupationally exposed persons could continually be subjected without any apparent harmful acute effects such as dermatite, radiodermatitis, arrhythmia of the skin. The general belief was that no adverse reactions from radiation exposure would be demonstrated at lower doses than this level. However, we now know that that's not true. So just because you don't have reddening of the skin or a tolerance dose or a threshold, they also call it a threshold dose, we could still have biological effects. So today, that is why we consider radiation, no amount of radiation considered safe. So it kind of shifted. However, we express this in units of Rankin, so that's important to know. We want to know that a tolerance dose is essentially the same thing as a threshold dose and essentially measured in Rankin units. So it's the big R. It was initially calculated and written down in Rankin units. So the threshold dose and the tolerance dose was for us, occupational workers. This dose was not for patients, not for anybody receiving radiation coming in for healthcare purposes. It's for the occupational healthcare worker. All right, so go ahead and turn the page, turn the page. It does tell you on page 62 that neither the tolerance nor the threshold dose is presently used for the purposes of radiation safety. We don't give you a threshold dose or a tolerance dose to say, okay, you can receive up to this amount and then you may die from it, but you can't get any more. Your actual dosing limits or maximum permissible dosages are much lower, much, much lower. I've only known one person who's ever reached their maximum permissible dose in occupational, and I think he worked for like 35 years in the OR, and he never wore lead, so he did reach his maximum per permissible dose, but only one person in my whole career. 
So first they started with, in 1934, the International X-ray and Radium Protection Commission recommended a tolerance dose or daily dose of 0.2 Rankin, important to know. That was the first occupational dose rate, <coughs> 0.2 Rankin per day. Okay, but then in 1936, two years later, they begin noticing that things are happening later. So just because we don't see initial or early tissue reactions doesn't mean that late tissue reactions are not occurring. So then they reduce the dose limit to 0.1 Rankin per day. So that was two years later in 1936. They noticed that there could be genetic, hereditary effects, things that could be happening. They call it stochastic later effects that have a threshold. Later effects that have a threshold. <clears throat> All right, let me just make sure I'm not missing anything here. All right, this is a good one. I'm still on page 62. In 1948, 1948, the United States developed a committee called the International System of Units. It is abbreviated by SI. So these are the units that we actually use today that are used internationally. So not just in America, these are non-traditional units. In these, you would find sievert, gray, milligray, millisievert, coulombs per, kilo, per kilogram, and sometimes exposure, sometimes exposure. In the modern era though, the modern era, so 1950s and beyond, we started using something called the maximum permissible dose. So you definitely wanna highlight that one, MPD. This replaced the tolerance dose for radiation protection purposes. MPD essentially indicates the largest dose of ionizing radiation that an occupationally exposed person was allowed to receive over a period of time. However, you guys know working with radiation, there's always a small risk involved with working with it because it's not considered essentially safe. So as the worker, you want to protect yourself as much as possible. So the actual um, term that we use today for radiation protection of occupational workers is the maximum permissible dose, the MPD. MPD. That's it was, yes, that is what we use today internationally, maximum permissible dose. So anything, any kind of limits, um, so they'll say like an occupational worker can receive this mm -hmm. amount, a pregnant worker could receive this amount, a radiologist that's been working in the field can receive this amount. That's called a maximum permissible dose. So what can you receive over a period of time and still work? Has to do with occupational. So they would have to be working in the field. It was initially a, um, documented in a unit called RIM. So RIM stands for Radiation Equivalent Man. I would probably know that. RIM is an acronym. So RIM. Radiation equivalent man. Page 62 under maximum permissible dose. And the old book is 67. Okay. Yeah. It was initially measured in REM, but now has been replaced by the SI unit Sievert. Sievert. How do I remember this one is match your E with your E. So Sievert and REM, Sievert and REM, and Grad and Gray. Grad and Gray. So R-A-D to gray, G-R-A-Y, and then match your E's, Sievert and REM. So this, re, this kind of replaced the tolerance dose, we call it the MPD, maximum permissible dose, measured in Sieverts, was originally measured in REM. Was originally measured in REM. So this solution where they decided or determined the maximum allowed permissible dose was compared, was used to compare the death rates and accidents among various occupations. So what does this mean? In every job that you work, there's gonna be some kind of risk involved. Whether you're a police officer and you might get shot, whether you work in a warehouse and you might drop something on your foot, you're driving a forklift, you might die. You're driving, you might die, right? You're walking, you might die. So there's some kind of risk involved with everything. So they give you a list of occupations that they compare that are considered very hazardous. So deep sea diving, professional mountaineering, some traditional or some non-hazardous occupations or trades, government desk work, any kind of office type work. So it's just comparing how dangerous is the job versus a typical 
high hazardous job or a non-hazardous job. So that's how they determine the initial maximum permissible dose. By the 1970s, dosimetry and risk analysis, had, risk analysis had become quite sophisticated. So radiation units were developed that contained factors that accounted for the various biological differences in radiation. So they give you a list here. Alpha, beta, gamma, X radiation, and neutrons. So in the very beginning, when we talked about the difference between waves on the EM spectrum and particulate radiation, particulate radiation has that mass, so it's going to do more damage. So they started saying, wait, if you receive 50 sieverts of gamma, it's not going to be the same if you receive 50 sieverts of X-ray. Gamma is much more damaging. So they associated something called weighing factors or weighting factors with these. So each type of radiation, alpha, beta, gamma, X, and neutrons, all have a weighting factor that we multiply by the dose received to determine actually how much damage could be occurring. This is just going to be an estimation, just an estimation. So it has nothing to do with the actual tissue that's being exposed, but it has to do with the type of radiation. So then they started discovering later on in the 1970s, later after the actual radiation weighting factors, that if you receive a whole body dose versus just a dose to your thyroid or just a dose to your brain or just a skin, skin entrance exposure dose, those things can vary. So they, dis they discovered that they needed to link tissue weighting factors in the calls as well. So this is what we call effective dose right? Effective dose. So this is when we take into account the actual tissue that's exposed versus red bone marrow, skin, brain, eye, things like that, thyroid. How much can you actually take before you would receive damage? And then we also take into account the radiation weighting factor. So did you receive x-ray? Did you receive gamma? Did you receive beta, neutrons? So those kind of are factored in for an effective dose. An effective dose. All right, so tissue weighting factor, effective dose. What was the other dose with the weighting, other weighting factors you talked about? Um, so radiation, are you talking about effective versus equivalent dose? We're yeah. just about to talk about that. We're going to turn the page. Yep. Yep, so if we want to separate them, we can separate them in terms of this. We have absorbed dose, absorbed dose, which is measured in what? Gray. Gray, Gray. correct. Absorbed dose. So that's actually what you receive. It's kind of the basic building block there. Then we have something called equivalent dose. It's noted as EQD, EQD, equivalent dose. It is taking into account just the radiation, just the type of radiation. So if you received five milligray of gamma, or you received four gray of x-ray, so we're just taking into account the x-ray or the radiation that was actually used. The most deep dose that we can actually calculate today is called the effective dose. It's noted as EFD, effective dose. This takes into account the tissue weighting factor and the type of radiation. The tissue factor and the radiation used. This is our best dose. It also breaks down how we measure or how we document fluoro. Uh, this is on page 64. Page 64, how we actually um, document fluoro. It's always measured in milligray per minute. So for sure want to know that. Milligray per minute. It says that most facil many facilities are still measuring in traditional units in America, which would be Rinkins per minute. Rankins per minute. When you guys write down the fluoro reading, do you know what's behind it? Is it gray, milligray, or Rankin? Gray. Good. Squares. All right, square. Okay. So milligray versus Rankin. Hopefully, one day we'll all be on the same page and we'll all use milligray because that's what we should be using. America shouldn't be difficult and they should go with what everybody else is doing. So it's standard for our SI units. That is the goal, at least. So the SI unit of absorbed dose, again, is gray. It's listed on page 64, um, abbreviated as GY, GY. So if you ever see something when it's noted like this, they're starting to kind of do this. 
but it's kind of new. So if you see G Y, and then you see a T here, or G Y, G Y versus T and R. These are newer kind of abbreviations that are used, determining if it's a dose related to a tissue weighting factor or a radiation weighting factor. So those are kind of new ones that you might see in the field soon. So this takes into account either A, the type of tissue that was radiated, or B, the type of radiation, right? So it's G, Y, and then a lowercase underneath it, T, or an R, depending on if it's using radiation or a tissue weighting factor. So you might see that, but it's, it's kind of new, so it's kind of phasing out a little bit. So the Gray, who developed it? His name was Lewis Harold Gray. He was super instrumental in developing what was arguably the most important theory in radiation dosimetry. So he was the person that said, hey, absorbed dose is good, but I want to know more about it. I want a standard measurement in it. How are we measuring absorbed dose? He is Gray. So this is the person who actually developed it. And he created this measurement by determining the absorbed radiation dose in a medium to a relatively simple measurement of an ionization charge. So basically, he took an ionization chamber and measured it. When he was able to develop the unit of gray, he had a standard. No gray, no radiation, how much is it actually being expressed in? He developed the gray, which is our SI unit. All right, any questions on effective versus equivalent dose? Let's look at the pages here and the charts that they give us. It should be... Just, uh, just yeah. to clarify, the, waiting, the tissue waiting period and the radiation waiting period, so does those both fall into effective dose? Correct. Okay. Yep, we take both into effect. So effective dose is our most accurate measurement. Our most accurate measurement. So let's look at how to calculate these. Go to page 69. We're going to kind of skip a little bit. We're going to come back and go over air permanent class, coulomb per kilogram, absorbed dose, dose area product, and radiation. That's what we're going to talk about next class. So fast forward here to the actual weighting factor charts. So on page 69 in my book, page 69 and 70. <clears throat> So 69, it's table 4.2. It says radiation weighting factors for different types and energy of ionizing radiation. So if we receive, I don't know, say 0.5 gray, 0.5 gray, and we know that it's x-ray, we would multiply it by one. So it kind of stays the same, right? It would be the same answer. However, if you receive that same amount of dose, and protons, we're going to multiply it by two. So the ones I want you to highlight on page 69 for your actual chart, you don't need to know when it breaks it down into kilo versus milla. So I want you to highlight x-ray and gamma. You need to know that that's a radiation factor of one. You definitely want to know neutrons. Neutrons, the beginning one, which is five. I've seen this one on the registry before. Protons, two and alpha particles 20. For your registry, if they ask you to calculate the effective or equivalent dose, equivalent, remember, just takes into account the type of radiation that's used, they will not give you the factors, okay? You are required to memorize the weighting factors. So I want you to memorize those. Those are the only ones that I've ever seen on a question from the registry. When we turn the page and we go to page 70, it gives you a nice chart, table 4.3, for organ or tissue weighting factors. So the ones that I would know for sure, for sure, without a doubt, if you want to highlight them, gonads, 0.2, red bone marrow, 0.12, lung, 0.12, breast, 0.05, and skin, 0.01. So if this makes sense to you, and if you're tracking, you should be able to see that a dose to the gonads is going to be way more serious than a skin entrance dose, right? Mm -hmm. So you can kind of compare them here. Breasts are not very radiosensitive. They can take a lot of dose. Skin can take a lot of dose. Red bone marrow cannot take a lot. And gonads can, can't take like any. So that's why we shield those areas. That's kind of how the shielding was taken into effect and developed. 
So what do we do if we know that we received, um, let's turn the page and look at the actual um, formula. On page 69, it will give you the formula. So if you're calculating the effective dose, you are going to use the radiation weighting factor times the tissue weighting factor, right? And that would be your absorbed dose for that. If you're calculating the actual equivalent dose, which is EQD, that's the one that's listed in the book, EQD, it's going to be dose, which is absorbed dose, time the weight, times the weighting factor of the radiation. So all you're doing is multiplying it out. So you definitely want to know the difference between effective and equivalent dose. Equivalent dose only taking into account the type of radiation used. Effective dose, which is our most popular and accurate, is going to take into account the tissue radiated and the type of radiation used. That box Let me see. I don't know if our boxes are the same. The no. Effective dose and equivalent dose types. I don't know. It's not the same online. I don't remember what. Effective yeah. this yeah. thing? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. The actual formula on yours. It's 4.8 online. 4.9. 4.8 on mine is the effective dose. So it's dose times the radiation weighting factor times the weighting times the tissue factor of the tissue. So the weighting factor of the tissue. All right, how do you guys feel about the multiplication? Do you want some practice problems next time, next class on them? Or do you think you can figure them out? Yeah. All right, so we'll practice some of that next time. But for homework, I want you to create your own. All right, so for homework, I want you to create two problems. Two problems. One equivalent and one effective. So you can use the ones in the book as a guide. Please don't use the same numbers because I want you to practice. Okay, it's only gonna benefit you. So one effective and one equivalent dose. Write the problem out and solve it. Okay, write the problem out and solve it. So it's just multiplying out the numbers. Next class, maybe I'll pull a couple of your numbers and make a worksheet for you so you can practice. So I want you to submit this by Monday at 11.59. One effective and one equivalent? Yep, one effective and one equivalent. So one tissue weighting factor with a radiation tissue with a radiation weighting factor for your effective. And when we use when we do your equivalent, we're only going to take into account the radiation. Okay. So you're gonna just make up a number in gray. Okay. 